Okay, let's um, make a start. Um, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Thank you all for, for being here today. Um, thanks to, uh, first of all, the Weatherhead Centre uh, at uh, Columbia University uh, for hosting this event uh, and to uh, Julie Kwan from the Weatherhead for all her work in, in getting this event organised. Uh, my name is David Brophy. I normally work at the University of Sydney. Uh, I'm currently visiting at the Weatherhead here in, uh, in New York. I'll be hosting uh, today's event, uh, which is held on the occasion of the, the first publication in English uh, of imprisoned Uyghur scholar Ilham Tofti's writings uh, entitled We Uyghurs Have No Say. Um, first of all, let me congratulate Verso for taking on this book uh, and also thank the, the translators, um, Talia Shre, uh, Cindy Carter and Matthew Robertson for their work in bringing Ilham's writings to a, uh, a wider audience. Uh, the book also contains an introduction uh, by our colleague uh, Ryan Thumb, which is uh, very much worth reading. If you haven't had a chance to see the book yet, <clears throat> uh, Verso has provided us with a discount code, uh, bringing it down to about $12 US. Um, and so I'll be putting that in, a ch in the chat uh, for you in, uh, in a second. Uh, Ilham Tofti was born in uh, 1969 in uh, Artush, in the south of uh, Xinjiang. He studied at uh, first at Northeast uh, Normal University in Changchun, uh, then spent much of his career at the Central Minzu University in Beijing. Uh, and he was appointed uh, a professor in the College of Economics there in 2003. Now, Ilham, uh, as he tells us in one of his interviews in this book, was unable to publish inside China from uh, 1999 onwards, uh, but he continued to write online. Uh, and many pieces in this book come from his uh, website, uh, Uyghur Online or Uyghur Biz uh, in Uyghur. So the first of these in the book is from 2005, uh, a piece called the, the Source of Xinjiang Ethnic Tensions as I See Them. And the last of these is from 2014, uh, which is a statement from him that was released uh, in September uh, after his brief two-day trial, um, uh, at the end of which he was sentenced to life in prison on charges of separatism. So the book is a collection of relatively short pieces, um, but it is for all that uh, a very weighty book. Uh, it's the voice of someone who's been silenced uh, by the state <clears throat> Uh, and we all very much hope that we'll see a day uh, when that verdict will be reversed uh, and Ilham will be able to walk free uh, and write again. Uh, and we call on the authorities in Beijing to allow him to do that. Uh, we sadly have no way of knowing exactly how Ilham might feel about the direction of events in China uh, and Xinjiang since his imprisonment. Um, I don't think anyone can put words in his mouth uh, on that topic but we are all clearly conscious of the way that things have deteriorated for Uyghurs uh, since that sentencing uh, in 2014. And I think today's discussion will range across um, his writings uh, and the work that he was trying to do uh, at that time, um, but also think about how these interventions relate to uh, more recent developments. So uh, to help us to do that, we had originally planned to have three panelists for this round table. Uh, unfortunately, I woke up this morning uh, to an email from uh, Professor Alessandra Capaletti, uh, who is Associate Professor and Head of the Department of International Studies at uh, Xi'an Jiao Tong, Liverpool University, uh, who wrote to tell me that she won't be able to join us uh, today. Now, I have to be honest, um, I did think it was something of a long shot to have someone uh, participate in an event like this uh, from China. Uh, but Alessandra had been very keen to be part of this, uh, having studied herself with Ilham uh, at Minzu University uh, a, a decade ago. And it was actually in conversation with her that the idea for this event um, came about. Um, some of you might be familiar with the monograph uh, that came from um, that work uh, entitled Socioeconomic Development in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, Disparities and Power Struggle in China's Northwest, published in, uh, in 2020, uh, which I recommend. Uh, unfortunately, having uh, initially gained approval for her participation from the, uh, the Public Security Bureau, uh, someone else has intervened at the last minute to revoke 
uh, that approval and she's been prevented uh, from joining us. Uh, Alessandra asked me to tell you uh, that she's been arguing with the PSD officers about this, um, telling them that they should have read um, Ilham's book and educated him themselves on, uh, on his views uh, before taking uh, action uh, like this. So this is very disappointing, uh, if not entirely uh, surprising. She has though provided some written comments, uh, which I'll read at certain points uh, in the discussion, uh, and our other panelists will be able to respond to her uh, even if she can't respond to, uh, to them. Um, so we're fortunate to have another student and colleague uh, of Ilham's with us today, um, Professor Dr. Abdurashid Jilil Khaluk, um, who uh, also spent considerable part of his career at Minzul University uh, and is now a member of the International Relations Department at uh, Haji Bayram Veli University in Ankara. Uh, he's a sociologist. Uh, his major book, uh, Chineseness and Others in China, Chin Lilik Ve Chinde Ötekiler, came out in its second edition last year. Um, and his long list of publications also includes uh, translations uh, from classical Uyghur literature and studies of the, uh, the Uyghur diaspora. Uh, alongside him, we have Dr. Runa Steinberg, uh, who is an anthropologist with uh, extensive fieldwork experience in Xinjiang. I think he may well have been the last foreign scholar to really spend serious time in, in southern uh, Xinjiang, in, in Kashgar and, and Artush. Uh, he's now a senior, research, uh, senior researcher at um, Palachki University in, in Olomouc in the uh, Czech Republic with the, uh, the Sinophone Borderlands project. Uh, he's also uh, in close collaboration with Uyghur postgraduate students uh, in Turkey, uh, bringing some of them into the Czech uh, university system. Uh, he is uh, publishing frequently on uh, topics such as Uyghur marriage and divorce, uh, economic transformations, uh, and racio uh, ethnic discrimination uh, in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Just a couple of uh, articles from the, uh, the last year, uh, one entitled Legitimate Corruption, Ethics of Bureaucracy and Kinship in Central Asia. Uh, it's in a journal called The Study, Studies of Transition States and Societies. Um, and another piece in Asian Ethnicity, uh, entitled Uyghur Customs, the Genesis, Popularity, Productivity, and Demise of a Modern Uyghur uh, Topos. So we plan to have a roundtable discussion uh, for about um, maybe around 40 minutes uh, or so, and then there'll be time for um, Q&A from, um, uh, from the audience. So unfortunately, we don't have the, the facility to allow people to, to speak directly um, in the event, but if you would like to make a contribution, um, uh, provide a question or just a comment um, on the um, the discussion that that um, I could um, I could read out. There's a Q and A function which I hope by now you're all familiar with. Just open up the Q and A box and um, put your question uh, in uh, in there. So um, with that introduction, let me then move to the discussion, um, and I'll. Start with Professor Abdurashid, um, because you studied and, and worked with Ilham for a uh, considerable amount of time. I'd like you to offer some thoughts on what he represented to you as a, a scholar, what was he like uh, as a teacher, and, and maybe if you could also talk about his, uh, his influence more widely on uh, Uyghur and, and non-Uyghur colleagues uh, in China. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to see everyone today. Uh, also, David Cross, and uh, uh, Luna. Uh, it's, uh, it's especially exciting uh, for me to be with you uh, to come to commemorate my teacher, uh, colleague, and uh, right honorable uh, friend, Ilhan Pop. Before I start, I would like to sincerely thank Saulia uh, Xue, Cindy Carter, and uh, Matthew Robertson uh, for translating the Ilham's valuable articles, essays, statements, and interviews into English. In addition, I would like to thank the organizer of uh, this meeting, Columbia University of the Head East Asian Institute, and the moderator, you, uh, Professor David Grothman. Uh, please allow me to uh, clarify in advance uh, today in my uh, 
speech or presentation or comments, I will not use the colonial uh, place name Xinjiang, which one, uh, as you know, imposed by uh, the Manchu to invaders to Uyghurs. Instead, I prefer use the name of uh, East Turkestan, which is the real name of occupied country name used by the Uyghurs and uh, others in Hadithas. Uh, in my opinion, Ilham Koki, as a scholar, uh, becomes a common voice of the tens of thousands of Uyghur intellectuals or hundreds of thousands uh, of voiceless minority intellectuals or scholars in China. He's one of the rare faculty members whose academic ethics can be considered very good because he is an honorable scholar who done question and they criticize the system in an institution like Minzu University of China. As you know, a former name is Central University for Nationalities and they changed it into Minzu University of China after 2009. Uh, this university overly politicized and affiliated with the, the State Ethnic Affairs Committee of China. At the same time, he is a conscious, responsible intellectual who does not only criticize the system or regime, but also makes positive policy and application suggestions for the system to be better and more functional. For the difference to live together in harmony and with peacefully. Uh, we know in uh, China, uh, according to China's constitution law, uh, there are 55 minorities in, in China. Although he knew that the price was very heavy as a current conjecture, he stood by the weak, not the strong, the right, not the unjust. He became the voice of uh, those who could not be here. According to some people, perhaps the majority in China or outside, he was uh, a Don Quixote because what he wanted was completely impossible under the CCP leadership and the traditional Chinese culture of governing others. But he still tried to be a hope, uh, a spark. Ilham was very idealistic and uh, probably means that what he is trying to do was impossible. But since he knew very well the dangerous situation faced on the Uyghurs, he also knew that in China's reality there was no other way out. Maybe he believed that something will be, uh, will or could happen in China, which was trying to integrate with the globalization uh, world. You may remember uh, that during Hu Jintao area, there was a discourse of building harmonious society. The... Yes, this uh, harmonious uh, society, uh, building harmonious society created uh, excitement in, in many intellectuals, uh, including uh, myself. We carry out project on this axis and made the recommendation to central government to build a harmonious society in China and a harmonious uh, nationality relations in China. Even my article published in uh, Uyghur Chinese, even English. 2009, 2010, 2011 uh, is the output of some uh, studies done uh, for the purpose. But uh, sitting in the leadership seat of the CCP, Xi Jinping showed that the Hu Jintao's discourse, which is building a harmonious society, is uh, actually dysfunctional, inconsistent, and impossible uh, done, but uh, is contrary to the uh, CCP trust. First, the elephants uh, disappointed many intellectuals, especially in Han Tokyo, who believed that the differences could live together in peace and solidarity. They were intellectuals who advocated pluralism and, and multiculturalism in China. 
but during uh, the Xi Jinping area, uh, they were uh, now punished at different levels. Uh, just for the south, uh, but Ilhan received the heaviest but unjust punishment because he is a woman. Uh, what was he like a teacher, Ilhan? In my opinion, uh, it would be better if I talk from my own experience to explain uh, Ilhan what kind of a teacher. Because uh, Ilhan in 19, 19, uh, 1990 to 1995, uh, he became our teacher in uh, Central University uh, for Nationality. But uh, at that time, he did not give us uh, lectures uh, directly because we are uh, different departments and the faculty. There were no Uyghur students at uh, the faculty where he worked, but only a few Mingkao Han, so that means Chinese speaking Uyghurs here in uh, his uh, department. After 1993, I remember he gave informal lectures to Uyghur students. I was participating in his private chat. At that time, there were no camera or devices inside campus in corridors or classroom like today. His lectures were mainly on the origins of inequality in East Turkestan, unemployment among the Uyghurs, and the radical changes in demo demographic structure in uh, East Turkestan since 1953. For the first time, we encountered a faculty member who questioned the system, thought and forced us to think and question. He was also an Uyghur, because at the time, uh, a lot of Uyghur uh, scholars in Minnesota University, but they never questioned the uh, system. This has been very exciting for young people like us. He advised it to the people not to be emotional, but to think rational. The emphasis to the importance of Uyghurs learning Chinese language and the culture very well without losing their own language and the culture. He would complain that China had already entered the market economy area when the Uyghurs were less prepared to it. It was in passes that young people, especially Uyghurs studying in big cities, uh, the inner uh, China, should be aware of this uh, and develop, uh, develop it uh, themselves according to this reality. So he wanted active interaction with the Chinese, telling the Chinese uh, about the situation of Uyghurs and the facts in East Turkestan. He also emphasized that Uyghurs should know what the China think and what they are trying to do. When I started my academic career as the Central University for Nationalities after my uh, completing uh, PhD in 2003 in Turkey, I saw that Ilhan Tofi had turned into a teacher now uh, by students all of nationalities. It's not a ethnic group, music and allowed it by some of them. Sometimes our lessons were in classrooms in, uh, side by side. I found his class was overflowing with students. I know uh, that students, some students come from other university, even from other cities in, uh, around the page. Later, uh, there were also intelligent officers in the classroom. I know from his lectures that Ilhan gave to Chinese speaking students in the following year while explaining the subject in more detail after making theoretical explanation. He was giving examples on the Turkestan problem in particular and the problems faced by minorities inside China in general. In his lectures, he was telling the students the facts they gathered from the field not the official propaganda data dictated by the system. With all its nakedness, there were subjects as the absolute majority, uh, the faculty members, 
would not dare uh, to talk about and to discuss if it, it was uh, implied. Uh, if you like, I, I, will, I would like to continue uh, Ilhan uh, influence Uyghurs and the non Uyghurs for uh, room. Please, please take another couple of minutes if you would like. Okay. What Ilhan did was actually a strange work for both the Uyghurs and the Han China because the system was not permitting to serious positive egalitarian relations and interactions between the Uyghurs and the Han China. By the uh, time uh, Ilham ran the Uyghur Biz forum and the website, uh, Uyghurs were already marginalized by the party state, where uh, authorities uh, in the inner China with very bad labels. In this Turkestan, however, Van Luchran was officially carried on state terror, intimidating and mar marginalizing uh, the Uyghurs in every field with his endless hard strike campaign. Yanda. On the axis of the so called fight with the three evil powers. Before the Uyghur Peace uh, Forum website and the website, where established Ilhan's uh, social and uh, academic influence was mainly through his university chair and the academic articles published through various uh, censorship process. In a difficult period uh, when Chinese nationalism was on the rise across China, Han chauvinism in East Turkestan continued under the support and the leadership of the party state and the Bin clan. The path of seeking legal rights for the Uyghurs was blocked. And hopelessness spread. During that period, Ilhan shone like a star in digital world in China. Following the internet based digital development in China, Ilhan established Uyghur online website and the forum at the end of 2005. Its main purpose was providing a platform both Uyghurs and Han Chinese meet for discussion and exchange their ideas and opinions. It was a wonderful opportunity to advance the interaction among Uyghur and Han Chinese and the contribution to development uh, of a, a culture of mutual understanding and uh, mutual respect. Uh, in other words, uh, to tear down the wall that the regime had built between uh, the Uyghurs and the China. The agonists of the Uyghurs uh, began to uh, directly express it and explain it by the victims on the Uyghur online website, which is run by an Uyghur scholar in Chinese language and screen. The problem of minorities, which you could never find a place in the mainstream media, such as migrant children, drug addiction, HIV disease, unemployment, inequality, discrimination, were voiced on this platform. Ilhan became the most well-known outspoken Uyghur intellectual in the Chinese world to add to his writings and comments. For this reason, until the 5th July Urench massacre, he was not well done among the Uyghurs who wrote and drew only in Uyghur language and the script. However, the ones who can write and spoken both Uyghur and the Chinese language among the Chinese and Uyghur communities are more familiar with Ilham and his rights. For most of minority intellectuals, he became a hope and uh, an example for seeking justice and the legal rights. As Uyghur Online uh, quickly became a popular website, his views reached a wider audience. At the same time, this questioning, criticizing, and the suggestive writings or discourse have been good material for some minority and Han Chinese scholars who want to gain a greater position in the face of rising Chinese nationalism. On this occasion, they further voiced their thesis that if 
the political rights of minorities are not taken back and if their nationality means status is not reduced to ethnic level, uh, says Luchu, uh, it will be a critical problem for the great Chinese nation. Of course, a significant number of Han Chinese intellectuals and intellectuals of other nationalities that I personally witnessed supported, uh, supported Ilham. The impasse that uh, the emergence of intellectuals like Ilham from minorities, especially from Uyghurs and the Tibetans, is very important to establish an egalitarian social order and uh, government orders that respects the rule of law. But after 2013, they were most disabled by the Xi Jinping regime. Due to this fact, they could not raise an effective voice against Ilhan's arrest and unjust crime. Intellectuals like me found uh, the only solution to leave the China, so the homes and the families. All of the Uyghurs who could not leave China, no, uh, as you know, in the concentration camps or missing. Intellectuals or other nationalities were almost silenced. They had cut off all communication with their colleagues who went abroad like me. Thank you, Professor Abdurashid. It's wonderful to have the perspective today of someone who knew Ilham so closely and um, worked in similar conditions uh, inside China. I might just quickly introduce um, Alessandra's re reflections uh, on this question and then um, I'll give Runa the opportunity to make some comments on this. I'll, so I'll just, just read what she's written. Um, <clears throat> Ilham opened my eyes on Uyghur society and on disparities existing in the region, disparities which follow ethnic lines. I arrived at Minzu University in 2010, and I was very excited to have him as PhD supervisor until when I discovered he was under house arrest and it was impossible to have him as a supervisor. I could only join his classes and Professor Kalup um, kindly accepted to supervise me. Uh, his classes were joined by hundreds of Uyghur students from many universities in Beijing. His energy was overwhelming. Uh, he was lecturing for three hours without a break. Uh, his passion and commitment were something amazing for me and all the other students. It was all based on data and figures collected during Ilham's fieldwork. Uh, I was the only foreigner joining his classes. Uh, and among the hundreds of Uyghur students, there were always four to five Han Chinese in plain clothes in their 30s to 40s taking notes. Uh, in some occasions, he could not deliver the class and a man uh, appeared in front of the students uh, stating that he had a toothache. Uh, he was establishing himself as a scholar and a vocal advocate for the rights of Uyghurs. Uh, besides joining his classes, I was going with his students to eat in Uyghur canteens nearby, uh, in particular with uh, Mutalip and his girlfriend. I uh, should just say this is um, Mutalip Imin and At Kemrozi, two students um, of Ilham's who were sentenced at the same time. My understanding is that their sentences technically should have finished by now, but I am not personally aware of whether they've been uh, released or not. Um, to continue, uh, Ilham was for them, uh, for all his students, a, a lighthouse. Ilham was meeting them in his small apartment just outside the Western Gate of campus. They were often discussing about how Uyghur Islam should have been reformed and modernized. He was gathering a wide range of students, journalists, scholars around him, Han, Uyghurs and foreigners, as he wanted to improve the communication among them and engage in sharing ideas and reducing the gaps among different cultures. He was charismatic and influential, as it was evident that he did not have an agenda, he was sincere and committed to the task of improving the standards of life for Uyghurs, as well as improving Chinese society by giving value to diversity. Uh, it was clear that Ilham loved his country, that he considered himself part of this place. She's writing from China, uh, of course. Um, now, Rune, I'm not sure if you had personal contact with Ilham, but I, I think you have a good grasp of the, the circle of Uyghur academics around him. Do you want to offer some thoughts on uh, his place in recent Uyghur intellectual history? Sure, yes, I'd love to. So um, between 2010 and 2016, I spent around two years in the region of Kashgar and Artush. And there I encountered a lot of Uyghur intellectuals who were familiar with Ilham's work. 
Um, and so I heard the reception that he got uh, in the southern parts of Xinjiang or East Turkestan, um, which was not always one-sided, um, um, but I'll return to that in a little bit. And then I had the pleasure of traveling through Beijing every time I went, uh, also in order not to get um, stamps from Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in my passport, because that I found out uh, would get the, the authorities' attention towards me. So I would travel through Beijing each time I was going, um, and that was quite often. And then I would often stay at the Mingzhu University in Beijing. And there I became acquainted with some of his students. I'm not going to mention any of their names here because I don't know whether they're uh, imprisoned or not, and, and I don't want to endanger them in any way. Um, I became quite close with a few of them who told me about his lectures and about his ideas and about uh, both their enthusiasm for him and his enthusiasm um, for the Uyghur case, which to them and to him was about improving uh, the lives of especially rural and urban poor Uyghurs in the region and also improving the region in itself in the sense of modernizing it. Ilham Tohti was very much a follower of a modernization ideology and in, in that he was not very far from the Chinese government actually, but he was quite far from them in the sense of judging how it had been implemented and also in how it should be implemented. Um, I had the pleasure of spending some some days and evenings with them, also going to the canteens that and, and Uyghur restaurants that Alessandra mentioned. And um, it seemed to me that uh, Ilham had collected around himself a group of people that he was encouraging to train in different topics. One of them was doing computer engineering, another one was focusing, uh, one of them was working with him directly on, on e economic topics. Um, and writing an economic history of uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, another one was focusing more on, on, on technical questions, and one was actually also uh, doing uh, psychological studies and, and reading into mental health uh, issues, all at the bequest of Ilham, who was, I think, I, as it seemed to me and as they portrayed it to me, um, creating a group, a team um, that could work with him, but also work beyond him. Because when I met these students, um, in the beginning, he had not yet been arrested, but he already had a pre-notion that this might happen. And he was preparing um, both his students and himself for the day when he might be approached by the authorities and he might be arrested or maybe even sentenced. The students I talked to and, and that I was close to were also quite close to his family. So um, it was a, a group that were supporting and helping each other more in the sense of, of the classical Central Asian or even also Chinese student teacher relationship and less in the sense of uh, just a modern university professor and his or her relations to uh, their students. They were involved also in his family. And after he was arrested, I also know that they helped his wife and, and his children um, beyond that. In Kashgar and other parts of uh, Xinjiang or East Turkestan, where I uh, talked to intellectuals and had contact with the intellectuals, there were two perceptions of Ilham. One was that he was very strong uh, in delivering the message that this is not just about um, the discrimination of the Uyghurs is not purely about racial or ethnical questions of identity per se, but it's an economically based discrimination. So it's a discrimination that is about land, it's about employment, it's about uh, economic factors. And I think he was extremely influential in getting this narrative across to a lot of Uyghur intellectuals who up until that point, and we can see that also in, in for instance, Rudelson's and other people's writing about intellectuals, were much more focused on history, questions of political legitimacy, 
Um, and here, Ilham, I think, probably along with others, but he was very strong, was in introducing the factor of the economy and of economic discrimination. He focused very strongly on the problem of rural uh, underemployment and unemployment amongst Uyghurs generally, and as Alessandra also mentioned, all the social problems that followed with it. And he was someone who was critical of traditional um, Islam, also strongly traditionalist Uyghur views, who were also quite strong in Kashgar and Artush at this point, um, arguing that a lot of the uh, Islamic uh, reformist and, and radical thought was a result, actually, of the unemployment, of the economic discrimination, of the limits that the government set to Uyghurs to participate in the modernization of China and of Chinese society, which he generally uh, supported quite heavily. And that led to the second perception of him in the Uyghur community. There were some, especially those who were more inclined to traditional and stronger um, religious views who saw him as being too, um, too close to government views, saw him as being not radical enough, saw him as being not militant enough for the Uyghur case. Of course, this was not stated publicly, but especially in 2010 to 2014, um, in Kashgar and Artush, there was quite a, an open discussion culture uh, in places where people felt they were amongst friends and they were safe. So a lot of these topics were very, discussed after 2014 and after the stepping up of surveillance and after people in the villages, uh, also many that I knew started to disappear into different forms of internment camps and re-education centers, and then later also uh, prisons um, to a high degree. This changed a little bit, but before that, um, people were stating quite openly that they thought Ilham Tohti was so a, a certain group of people that they thought he was not radical enough for um, pushing for Uyghur independence, uh, for instance, which was definitely something also that people discussed and that he was too critical towards um, the religious uh, traditions of the Uyghurs or also the new, uh, more pious religiosity coming in. So I would say that's that's my introduction to Ilham, which was more indirect, um, but but I definitely saw him as a very influential figure. And from the outset, I had the utmost respect for him. And I think he has definitely also um, influenced my academic work on Xinjiang. And I saw a lot of the analysis that he now introduces in his book, actually applying very much to the situation in Southern Xinjiang that I found during my field work uh, between 2010 and 2016, and also the interviews I've since led in the Uyghur diaspora um, about the situation in these Southern oases. Mm. Thanks, Runa. So let's let's talk a little bit about the book more specifically and some of the, the interventions that it, it contains. I was hoping to get your thoughts on what you see as the, the key arguments that he's advancing at different points that are that are marked by these um uh by these essays and interviews what were the important debates at that time and are there any specific uh essays or, or interviews that you you'd like to highlight i might <clears throat> i might just briefly um give a give an edited version of alessandra's um comments she has some more praise here for his you know his his understanding of socioeconomic dynamics in in xinjiang and china she goes on to say the key parts of the policy recommendations, they provide guidance on how to build a uh, peaceful and inclusive society by giving value to diversity. Uh, if authorities in Xinjiang would have considered them, it would have helped building a better society. He was looking at how the unequal redistribution of resources was creating a negative feeling and resistance among Uyghurs. He was still optimistic. Uh, he considered the migration of young Uyghurs from the countryside to the urban areas as a chance for Uyghurs to engage in jobs such as construction and petty business, and in this way to grow their awareness about their status as, um, she says, B-series citizens, probably say second-class citizens. Uh, he was foreseeing a period of necessary struggle, but one that would be conducive to a better society. Um, he was sharing these ideas with scholars and journalists, mainly Han, 
Uh, his criticisms were to the local authorities and to the system. There were criticisms from the left. Uh, he was considering the quest for power and the redistribution of resources as a fundamental factor generating inequalities and distress uh, within society. Uh, she says she wants to highlight the, the long essay in the book uh, in particular. She's referring there to a, an essay <clears throat> called Present Day Ethnic Problems in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, Overview and Recommendations, um, which is dated in the book to 2013. It was apparently written in response to a request in 2011 from government uh, officials, presumably still in the wake of the 2009 riots uh, in Urumqi. It was never published, but it was posted online uh, after his uh, arrest. Uh, she says, this part contains keys to unpack the current situation in Xinjiang to understand the roots and the possible way forward. Uh, she also says that the conclusion of the book, the very last sentences shows the level of human understanding, piety and generosity of Ilham as a person and a scholar. Um, maybe turn back to you, Professor Abdurishit. Um, are there particular uh, points in this book that you'd like to highlight for the audience um, today? Uh, you're, you're on mute still. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Uh, in my opinion, all of them are very valuable. There are no reason to highlight anyone uh, because uh, this book, uh, including topics, is uh, very valuable. Uh, articles, interviews, evaluation uh, are consistent of the facts and expectation of uh, that minorities in general and the Uyghurs in particular, uh, they cannot express directly and clearly and as their voices cannot be heard. They were all written by uh, Ilham missionary and visionary uh, academic perspective with a sense of responsibility. Uh, so I think uh, it's very uh, good, uh, this book. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, he published many research papers in Chinese, even uh, Uyghurs, uh, Uyghur language, uh, after uh, this political and uh, ideological censorship. And he reviewed journals uh, until he was banned from academic publication. Uh, so, of course, it would be uh, more complete and uh, uh, perfect if uh, his uh, other academic articles, research reports, and the field work report, various suggestions uh, he presented to the central government, right, included, it may be better. But uh, in the future, uh, maybe research work will be uh, published or translated into English. It's also very valuable. Uh, it's current form of the book, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I also think this book should be translated into other common language like mm. French or German or Russian. Uh, I uh, promise I will do my best and uh, try to translate the version of mm. the book into Turkish. Mm. Uh, I think it's uh, important. Uh, yes, I imagine that's that's um, that the publishers would be very happy to to see that. Um, if you if you need any help in communicating with 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 Verso, I've I've been talking to them, so we could um, certainly facilitate that. Uh, Runa, do you want to say more on the book itself? Yes, yeah. sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I completely agree with uh, Professor Abdur Kaluk's points. Um, to me, what really colored my experience of going to the region was were the events in Urumqi in 2009. The, the violence, the uh, state violence, and the ethnic tension that this produced, but also the reaction to it. And um, Ilham actually has a part in his book where he praises the initial uh, political, economic political reaction of the uh, then new party secretary, uh, Zhang Chunxian, I believe was his name, um, who came to power 
Um, after uh, Wang Lechen, who was the party secretary before him, was removed after the violence of Urumqi. And there was a rethinking. Um, and I think that both the book and in a sense, Ilan Tohti's scholarship can be structured um, over this event. Uh, there is a before and there is an after. And basically, um, if we start with the after, and I would like to highlight uh, the, uh, I think it's the third essay in the book um, that is called, um, is it time to change ethnic policies um, in, uh, yeah, isn't it time to rethink China's ethnic policies, um, where he builds up what I think is an argument that picks up a lot of his older work and channels them into something that becomes really valuable, I think, to our understanding of how the, um, the tensions um, developed. And so basically what he says is there is clearly a problem. We don't have ethnic harmony as the government says we do or as other people might suggest there is. There is a clear problem. Where lies the problem? The government says that the problem comes from the outside, from outside forces interfering, bringing in uh, notions of separatism, bringing in notions of radicalism. But Ilham says, in his opinion, that's not the case. The problem lies in the fact that a big, big part of the Uyghur population of the region has been excluded from rapid economic transformation, uh, the growth that the region has experienced, they haven't been included into that, they haven't been a part of that, and that has led to an extreme alienation, an alienation that they are often, and to, in his opinion, rightfully so, connect to the strong influx of Han Chinese migrants to the region. And so, he says that if we want to solve the ethnic tensions, we need to address these problems. We need to address the economic problems, the unemployment, the underemployment, and uh, the, the problems in education and the social problems that this brings. He suggests to uh, invest much more into the education of minorities in the region. He suggests to set up uh, different for programs for creating um, um, more employment and creating growth also in the south of Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region or East Turkestan. And I think these were some of the policies that the government actually started to implement after 2010. Some of these economic policies they started to put into action. Just as before also, Ilham Tohti has promoted modernization of the region, development of the region. And this, these were also things where he was sort of in tune with the government. I'm not saying necessarily that the government implemented some of these policies because Ilham Tohti was uh, promoting them. I think many people were promoting them. Many people saw that he was right, though most people did not dare speak it out so bluntly, that he was right in the sense that there was a deep problem with economic inequality and that that was racially structured or ethnically structured and that that went back to discrimination against Uyghurs both inside the political system and in the private uh, economical system and also especially the, all the overlaps between them like SOEs and so on and so forth. So I think there was a certain understanding that that was true. Now, when I say that the government implemented some of the policies that he had suggested on beforehand, they did do so on the surface, but what they did not do was to add to that the deeper changes that he also saw was needed. So he talks about um, doing something against underemployment and unemployment. He talks about doing something against uh, this frustration amongst the Uyghurs, including them more, but, um, and also about education, investing into education and so on and so forth. What he then, come, the conclusion that he comes to is that that is actually only possible through a real implementation of autonomy for the Uyghurs. And that the crux 
of the whole matter is not just piling on economic development, investment, and so on, as long as that investment mainly goes to the Han Chinese, to the migrants, to the big companies coming in from the East, you can keep going and it would still create the same kind of tensions because you keep reproducing and even make stronger sometimes the problem of inequality. Because if you have a group of people here, the Uyghurs who are in big part excluded from the development, the faster the development goes amongst the Han, the bigger the gap grows between Uyghurs and Han. And this I really saw happening in Kashgar while I was there, especially after 2014. So my experience was to put it very briefly from 2010 to 2013, there really was an explosion of investment in Kashgar. And a lot of it was done by Han Chinese companies coming in from the East. And they were also skimming a lot of the, uh, the cream from that. But there was a trickle down effect to local business elites, to local Uyghurs who got some kind of employment, but the inequality was growing. And when things got worse and tensions heightened and we had all of these attacks and different forms of, of violent resistance in 2013 and 2014, and then the the government in Xinjiang uh, implemented all of these new restrictions, restrictions on mobility, restrictions on religion, restrictions on, on pol pol political restrictions, even on dance, um, on weddings, that which was what I was studying at the time. Um, this completely destroyed Uyghur participation, which was already very low. And it, um, Uyghur participation in these developments and it destroyed the local economy in a lot of places. And so what had been, as Ilham also writes, going in the right direction, but not quite far enough and not quite addressing the underlying problems of the ethnic discrimination from 2014 on was in a sense completely destroyed. And so I would like to highlight how he shows that the events in Urimchi are due to economic disparities, but that these economic disparities cannot really be resolved unless the problem of ethnic discrimination is addressed head on. And in his opinion, and I tend to agree, this can only be done through a real implementation of Uyghur autonomy in the region, which there is a base for in Chinese law. And he keeps coming back to that and keeps referring to that, um, and which is, which is not being implemented. And that's also an area where I think he got a lot of, of uh, positive feedback from the Han Chinese uh, intellectuals. And I think maybe we can talk about that a bit later, but I think that's a very, very important part of legacy also that he was listened to and taken seriously by the Han Chinese intellectuals, also because he took seriously, at least on the surface, the government's uh, premises. He just showed them how they did not carry out um, what, they, what they preached, um, but he engaged uh, deeply also with even PRC uh, policy argument. And, and I think that made him very valuable, but probably also in their eyes, very dangerous mm. uh, in the end. Thanks very much, Rune. I, I, it's, what you're saying is very interesting. I think, it, I think it points to a certain tension or contradiction that you can see in the state rhetoric in, in China today, which is obviously still <clears throat> very de de developmentalist. Mm -hmm. Uyghurs need vocational training and so on, but at the same time, because the, the materialist analysis of conflict and violence in Xinjiang, East Turkestan is associated with people like Ilham Tofti, that line that these things originate in inequality or so on has also been rendered basically taboo uh, in the discussion that this is essentially um, giving ground to, to separatist um separatist thinking um yeah. so <laughs> in mm. some ways what what the chinese government have implemented now since 2014 has been very counter development mm. for on a local scale if you mm. look at the statistics there is a drop 
in, in GDP, in, in trade around 2014, 15, but then it picks up again, but it only picks up because of the heavy investment into the camps, surveillance, security industries, and so on and so forth. And the local, the local economy really suffered heavily. And, and one of the things I think it suffered very much under, and that Ilham also addresses here, is that up until 2014, actually a lot of Uyghurs were starting to be engaged in trade with Central Asia. And they had the cultural and linguistic knowledge and capacity to do it well. And it was really developing and taken off. And when their passports were revoked, when it was made impossible for them to even travel freely around the region itself, uh, and not to think of crossing borders at all, all of that came crashing down. It was really, I think, devastating to the local economies of southern Xinjiang. Mm. Right. Um, Professor Abdurashid, you might have thoughts in response to things that Runa is saying, but please hold them for the next next question. I'd like to ask one more question. Um, and then I'd also like to encourage uh, anyone in the audience who has their own question, uh, if you'd like to raise them, we should um, <clears throat> should be able to have about uh, 20 minutes or so at the end of this um, for questions from the, the audience. We've already talked a little bit about the, the differences between the situation today and the, the time in which um, uh, Ilham was writing, we've talked about his, his, his optimism, his insistence that change could only come about through dialogue between Uyghurs and, and Chinese. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to re reflect on how his imprisonment and the, the wider crackdown on Uy the Uyghur Academy has changed the, the, the intellectual terrain in, uh, in, in China. I mean, is there any space left to contest policy the way that that he did do, do his writings um, or the model of scholarship that he he provided what what relevance do they have um, regarding the the situation uh, for for Uyghurs today maybe I'll change the order so I'll I'll ask Runa first and then come back and give Professor Abdurashid the the last word on this okay uh, I'll 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 try to be short then thank you. Um, I think one thing that we see in the essays in this book is something that uh, David Graeber has described as the, the, the stupidity of power or the, that is in, entrenched in any kind of uh, situation of structural violence where you have a group that has the upper hand and a group that is suppressed and the group that has the upper hand understanding nothing about the group that's suppressed because they don't need to but the group that's suppressed creating a form of intelligence that goes way beyond the group on the upper hand because they have to and i think ilham tohti was an example of that and he he um created an understanding he obviously read and reacted to the debates in Chinese academia and amongst Chinese intellectuals. He quotes Ma Rong several times in this book, saying that Ma Rong has also, like himself, seen that there's something wrong with the ethnic relations in Xinjiang, but Ma Rong is suggesting a different path. He's suggesting to completely dissolve the notion of ethnicity and thinks this will lead to basically like closing your eyes to the difference between uh, black and white in the US or immigrants and and uh, right-wingers in, in Europe uh, will solve the, the problem. And Ilham says, well, that cannot be the case. It can only basically be said by someone who doesn't understand what's going on on the ground. And I think he was pointing to the fact that, okay, he and other Uyghurs were reading the Chinese and understanding their points of views, but the, other, the, the opposite, the reverse was not the case. But Ilham was providing a, a window into that providing an, um, an option where Chinese policymakers, intellectuals, and so on could get an Uyghur perspective, which they were otherwise barred from because they didn't speak the language and also because people either did not dare or was not, were not capable uh, um, intellectually in Chinese of, of formulating the local perspective in a way that it was palatable uh, to Chinese intellectuals. With his imprisonment, that disappeared. That 
possibility of having a real dialogue of really understanding things on the ground of getting out of this stupidity of power from the side of the of the power holders that disappeared it wasn't just him there were other Uyghur intellectuals as well but with his imprisonment they stopped speaking because of course they were afraid and the whole around that time 2014 this the whole situation changed dramatically people started moving away uh, like uh, Abdur uh, Professor Abdur uh, himself and also others, other intellectuals that were critical that I knew uh, from the region started moving out or they fell silent. And then from 2017, I think everybody whom the Chinese government could have drawn on to create any kind of dialogue or to actually bring Uyghurs closer to the government, not out of fear, but out of, of of conviction, all of these Uyghur intellectuals whose books I have here on, on my shelves who have now been removed from the bookshelves in all of the region and are forbidden, uh, they were, all of them, most of them were proponents of development. Uh, economics, of uh, modernization, of moving into an in, sort of, as they saw it, enlightened era in a, in a way that was actually very conducive to, to Chinese government policy. But that whole base has now been completely destroyed. That possibility has just been imprisoned, silenced, in some cases killed more, more or less purposefully. Um, and so I think we're really at a a very bleak and and dark point in the sense of um, a possibility of understanding and dialogue, unfortunately. And I think it very much started uh, with the imprisonment of Ilham Tohti. Okay, I'll just throw in uh, Alessandra's remarks. So I'll, I'll select a few points from what she's what she said on this. Um, Ilham Tohti is one of the most prominent political prisoners in contemporary China. Uh, but his persona, his life, his identity have all been deleted from collective awareness and collective memory. The, the new generations do not know anything about him. Scholars do not consider his work. Um, Ma Rong, who Runa just mentioned, Ma Rong and Yang Shengming be have become the ones who advise on ethnic policies, advocating the necessity for the disappearance of Uyghur identity. Uh, she says the importance of this book lies in keeping Ilham's work and thoughts uh, alive. Um, maybe just a couple of points about working inside China, where she currently is. Um, <clears throat> it is currently impossible in China to do research on Xinjiang and the Uyghurs. Before the Beijing Olympics of 2008, the situation was rather open uh, and it was possible to conduct informal research in Xinjiang. After the Olympics and up to 2015, it was not a problem to research Xinjiang economy and culture uh, slash folklore. Today, it is impossible to conduct any kind of research on Xinjiang and Uyghur related issue, issues. The region is de facto not accessible anymore. Uh, it is in a state of military curfew. Um, she says this is according to people who went there for, um, for holiday breaks. Um, talking and communicating with Uyghurs is not possible because any Uyghur who is seen with a foreigner uh, is in danger. Uh, at the same time, uh, she adds, there are many Uyghurs who have been co-opted into the system uh, in various ways and function as bait on a hook um, for hand, hand public security officials who want to monitor the activities of foreigners uh, who communicate with, uh, with Uyghurs. Press up the Rashid, would you like to comment on uh, relevance of Ilham for today? Thank you. Uh, I would like to say something about uh, Ilham's uh, important debates, uh, especially what he wants uh, to do uh, academic life or uh, life. Uh, I, I think uh, Ilham Tokti actually sacrificed himself to make the impossible the possible under the uh, CCP regime. So it's impossible actually uh, is uh, seeking uh, to create peaceful and uh, coexistence miracle uh, between the one side of excluded and the demonized 
uh, nation, nation or its Uyghur by the party state. And uh, uh, but other side, other side was brainwashing by the communist state whose culture of Christianity uh, did not uh, develop it much uh, and uh, did not include pluralism. Besides, uh, Uyghur and the Han Chinese actually very difficult to uh, coexist. Uh, Ilham was saying with uh, his own mouth, uh, he said, I will uh, devote myself to Xinjiang social, economic, and cultural development to internationality understand and to find the way to achieve harmonious ethno-national coexistence aimed to social transform uh, tr uh, trans transformation uh, today at the time. All of uh, his work, as you know, uh, done uh, in Chinese language and script. And his target audience was mostly Chinese-speaking intellectuals, students, common people, and the Chinese scholars or the policy makers. Nor was he totally failure. Uh, a substantial number of Chinese-speaking consciences, some Chinese intellectuals understood Ilham and the support uh, him, albeit to a limited uh, extent. I, I would like to emphasize uh, one point. Ilhan sees himself as a scholar, not activist uh, politicians. And his contribution to this cause deserves serious attention. Ilhan is a, a prominent Uyghur uh, thinker on the status of non Chinese nationalities within the world's largest state, the PRC. I don't know. Who first called Ilhan is China's uh, Mandela. But Howard said it was actually right. Anyone who knows Ilhan easily understands that he is a peace loving man like Mandela, or even more courageous than uh, peace. Uh, they will also surprise us that Ilhan is sincere enough to die for justice and uh, uh, the rule of uh, law. After Wang Luchan's rule in the term of Jiang Chunxian, in an environment where uh, it became impossible for Uyghur intellectuals to write their voice in East Turkestan, who were constantly suppressed, excluded, and punished in violation of China's uh, current laws. Ilham Tokyo began to make a bold voice in Beijing. Of course, while doing this, Ilham never violated the Chinese laws, did not talk and speak, uh, spoke and wrote with the data he collected from the field and with the concrete materials. As a person who has experienced it, I'll observe personally that even so, Ilham knew there is a gap between discourse and the action in the Chinese bureaucracy. Real solidarity and the nationalities uh, would emerge with the implementations of CCP discourse and the laws on the papers. And the said uh, the con uh, construction of a harmonious society in Fujin Tao's uh, discourse would be possible. Which, uh, with such an expectation and the belief, he actually complained uh, to the uh, Chinese people about the discrimination, exclusion, exclusion, the marginalization, and the state hand uh, demonization process of CCP throughout the Uyghurs. To try it, uh, to digitally realize the interaction between Uyghurs and the Han Chinese, this was actually an unusual per se uh, for the CCP. In fact, it was a game changer and a disorderly attempt uh, for the CCP. Ilhan was not against the internalization uh, of the Uyghur issue in particular or uh, the East Turkestan question in general. He believed that the solution to the problem would be through dialogue between Uyghur and uh, Han Chinese. In fact, he knew that this was not possible in modern China 
under the hegemony of the CCP. But thinking rationally, he also realized that logically it should be done. So he made an unprecedented sacrifice of himself. Ilham never did support, uh, never did or support any kind of separatism in the uh, discourse of CCP regime. Despite so many provocative and humiliating acts against him, he has always opposed all forms of violence, bullying and the uh, use of force. On the contrary, what he said and uh, did was completely in line with the CCP's own discourse on the paper. He did not violate the any article of existing Chinese law. He just wanted the rights promised to minorities mentioned in the Chinese constitution, especially in laws such as regional autonomy law, religious belief law, language and the scripts law to be given and reflected in practice. He wanted people and the nationalities who were non-Chinese to be respected and not marginalized. He expressed this argument loudly. He demanded that they not to be treated like foreigners in their own homeland. He believed in a civilized age, differences could coexist and that could be done very well in China. The most dreamy of our pluralist and multiculturalist society with the rule of law. All his discussions were about uh, that reality. So uh, Ilhan actually uh, in, in China uh, is actually a very important scholar and a thinker for uh, differences coexist or uh, in Fujintao area say like uh, harmonious uh, international relations like but uh, in, in Xi Jinping area, they lost uh, this kind of thinker, uh, scholars uh, were bad uh, for uh, CCP for China. Uh, if you give me one minute, I would like to say Please. a few words about Ilhan Tokyo uh, because uh, he uh, faced many difficulties and obstacles uh, in, uh, before 2013. If he had only focused on his academic career, perhaps he could, would have been a brilliant Chinese scholar or international scholar. Or if he had continued his business because he uh, ran business in uh, inner China in Central Asia before 2009. He could have become a very successful businessman or economist or even a multimillionaire or have to cooperate with the CCP, like other uh, scholars, he, he could have risen to very high positions in the bureaucracy with uh, his uh, fluent Chinese and the uh, Chinese cultural knowledge. Because a lot of Uyghurs in China, in bureaucracy, in CCP, they cannot speak very well China, Chinese. Uh, but he chose, but he chose what no one dare. Now he is uh, in prison. His wife and the two children are orphaned in Beijing. Before that, they face so many difficulties in Beijing, but we cannot do anything. The CCP fascism prevents us from even basic human communication with our family or uh, enhanced wife or children. This is our reality now. Thank you. Thank you very much for ending on that um, important note, Professor Abdurishid. Uh, I'd like to again ask if anyone has questions to please put them into the, the Q&A box. So if, if you even just have comments that you'd like to uh, read out, we, we, have a few, uh, we have a few minutes now. We, we have one question I'll, um, that's uh, directed to, um, to Runa. This is uh, from uh, Mr. Envejan, who's from the um, the NGO, the Ilham Tohti uh, Initiative, he uh, he mentions here that he um, he appreciates uh, Wuna's assessment and testimony uh, about the situation in the um, in, in the South. Uh, and the question that he asks is, um, well, is it the reason that that the government 
wanted to silence him was perhaps that um, he knew what the real problem uh, was and uh, was suggesting a realistic way on how to solve the problem. Do you have any response to that? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Envarjanaka. Um, I'm glad that you approve of, of my very short uh, analysis of the situation. I do think that, yes, you're right, that one of the reasons that uh, Ilham Tohti was particularly dangerous to the government or the government perceived him as particularly dangerous was that unlike a lot of other um, say Uyghur activists or even uh, people who were also active scholars, um, Ilham did, did suggest, so I think he understood the problem quite deeply uh, that, that was happening and he presented realistic solutions, as you say, that were alternative solutions to what the government and what the, the um, Communist Party themselves were suggesting. And he did it, I think, beyond that in their language, in a language that was palatable to uh, Chinese intellectuals, even to government circles. Um, as Professor Abdurashid has also pointed out, he was using terms that did not go beyond really the universe create the intellectual intellectual um, and ideological universe uh, created by the party itself and uh, the, the fact that he used such words as han chauvinism which is an established term uh, even though it had gone out of of use uh, or out of fashion, um, but also that he spoke much about inequality, uh, unemployment and so on and so forth. Um, and, and rights also, which unlike what many um, might perceive from Western media is, is a discourse in Chinese politics and, and economy, even though it's not much of a practice, unfortunately, especially in regions like Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So he was addressing these problems in a language that was understandable, that couldn't easily be demonized. There was no racism uh, to be detected in his um, in his criticism, there was no, as also Professor Abdushit mentioned, no separatism, there was no religious, religious extremism in any way. He could not be easily put in this box of the three evils or even of foreign influences, but because he was speaking in Chinese, in Chinese idiomatic terms, familiar to Chinese intellectuals and the government. So I do think that that was a big part of what made him risky and dangerous to them, that he was speaking in a language that they knew a lot of people would accept and that he was she, he had a profound knowledge of what was happening in the region and what was going wrong in the region. So he's presenting in a sense an analysis that was superior to what they could present themselves or at least what they choose to chose to react on themselves. Yeah, I think that's a key point, really, that he was a very difficult figure to portray as the, the stereotypical bogeyman um, in the in the Chinese in the Chinese context. A lot of his proposals are come out of a long history of debate within the, the communist tradition about um, engagement between the center and um, peripheral region. I mean, his call, for example, for Chinese officials to study the local languages and be able to communicate in local languages when he, uh, when they go to um, uh, a place like Kashgar. This was, um, you know, this was originally part of the the Bolshevik um, proposal to to nationalize administration in these regions, um, going back to the the, the 1920s. Um, I don't think he was exclusively standing in that tradition, but you know, you can definitely hear echoes of it in his, um, uh, in his, uh, in his work. Yes, and also the Deng Xiaoping uh, sort of rhetoric, which up until 2009, 2010 was still, was still reiterated in the, the Xinjiang Statistical Yearbook. In the very beginning, they, they start out their introduction by saying in the spirit of Deng Xiaoping, this disappears 
uh, with Xi Jinping uh, coming into the picture, but his ideas of economic development and also of the cooperation between the different national groups or ethnic groups in that uh, development, I think is very much also echoed in Ilham's writings. For instance, in the, uh, the long essay that Alessandra uh, suggested, um, he explicitly um, recommends that Han Chinese and Uyghur entrepreneurs should be encouraged to cooperate, should be given incentives to work together using the Uyghur's knowledge of language and culture in Central Asia, and also, of course, uh, Xinjiang or East Turkestan region itself, in order to uh, create sort of mutually beneficial uh, cooperation between them. And I think that was that's a language that's really difficult to, to dismiss. Um, by the authorities. I also think that till debt today, so I, I read the, the, the judgment that was, that was uh, spoken over Ilham uh, and all the court papers I could see or find recently, some of them have been translated and published um, along with other cases of, of uh, dissidents and political prisoners in China. And till this day, there's actually, they're just empty categories of him being a separatist, of him promoting violence. There's not one shred of real evidence of saying, this is a sentence he wrote. From that sentence, you can clearly see that he is promoting this or that. None whatsoever. And when you read the essays, I mean, as Ryan also very, very um, beautifully, I think, writes in the introduction, people will be really, really surprised and, and, and kind of baffled to find that these writings were what gave him the label of separatist or radical anti-Chinese. There's absolutely no connection between them. Um, and I, but I think as Enver Dan and you now also suggest that that's probably a big part of what made him so, so dangerous that he could not so easily be dismissed, demonized or, or labeled as something uh, illegal. Let me just ask, um, oh, have we just lost Professor Abdurashid? I think so, yes. Well, we'll see if he comes back. I was going to put a question uh, to him. Um, in the meantime, look, we've, we've, got, we've only got a few, few minutes, but I'll just ask, um, pose this question uh, from Sam Bass. Um, this is to do with why is Ilham particularly dangerous? Ilham was a colleague of Wurser, the Tibetan writer who is highly critical of China and ethnic policies. Wurser's freedoms are curtailed. She can't get a passport, is under occasional house arrest and so on, but has never been charged with crimes, despite her writings being more widely disseminated and her criticisms of China more direct. She is in a sense, an easily identifiable bogeyman of ethnic separatism. What do you think accounts for the differential treatment of Ilham Tohti? Uh, his use of in-group discourse in policy suggestion, as Runa says, or something more about international awareness of Tibet, or was his arrest just symptomatic of the overall crackdown in Xinjiang beginning around 2014? Um, well, Runa, do you have any thoughts on that? We've well, I, uh, I think all of the above, in a sense, I think it's actually um, um, a really good analysis by Sam. Um, I do not know much of Wusser's writing, uh, though I have I've seen that, that is she's the author of the recent book that was translated and published by Robbie Barnett, right? I, I believe on 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 Lhasa. So that one I have been reading into, but otherwise I I don't I haven't seen that. I think that in I mean maybe already uh, starting with. China participating in the, the international war on terror uh, and joining that along with joining the WTO because that was seemingly the Americans precondition for being able to join the WTO to also um, be, a, be a part of that. Um, with that, I think a slow shift towards more focus on Xinjiang and the, um, and the Uyghur issue and less on Tibet, or at least a different kind of focus uh, and, and a more violent one directed towards the Uyghurs because they could be labeled terrorists and radical Islamists. And there was more of an acceptance of that. Whereas, as Sam also suggests, uh, 
Tibet had much more traction in, in an international connection, um, at least up until 2017. I think that that might be a reason um, for this difference in treatment, but also maybe uh, the fact that Ilham was so close to Chinese intellectuals and was, was very much a part of that scene. Um, okay, we'll probably have to wrap this up um in a minute we, we had a couple of other questions one is from an anonymous um tibetan attendee asking about restriction on movement for ordinary uyghurs if they want to leave xinjiang travel for study pilgrimage other purposes can deal with that fairly briefly i think most of those things are basically impossible for uyghurs today there may still be a very small quota um for people um politically reliable people to to go on the hajj but um uh otherwise these Taking the initiative to to travel abroad for study pilgrimage, this is this is really not uh, not happening uh, for Uyghurs. We also had a very good question uh, that I was hoping to pose to Professor Abdurashit on Ilham Tofti's thoughts, whether they're influential uh, in the Uyghur diaspora community and and in what ways. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we have the opportunity to get the answer for that. Um, it would be a nice starting point for uh, another discussion, uh, perhaps. Um, so, look, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, thanks to the panelists for joining us from, from different time zones and, of course, Alessandra uh, in uh, absentia. Uh, thanks to the audience for uh, the questions. Remember to, to buy the book, um, read it and share it. I'll just post the, uh, the Verso link again for anyone, which um, makes that very affordable. Um, and um, look, I hope that book serves as a starting point for wider engagement with the issues that this a uh, very brave scholar uh, dedicated his, uh, his, his working uh, life to. So I do recommend you check it out. Also, if you'd like to um, help share this video um, when it becomes available, uh, that will also contribute to um, publicizing the, uh, the appearance of this, uh, this important book. So um, once again, thank you all for uh, being here today uh, and we will leave it uh, at, uh, at that. Thanks a lot. Thank you.